Okay, so with that, uh, we'd like to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. I see we have 83 attendees on. We did have um, quite a few RSVPs, so I expect a number of additional people will come on the call. Before we dive into the presentation, I just want to go through a few logistics. First and foremost, in terms of question and answers, if you see on the webinar, there is a Q&A um, button. All questions that we'll take need to be typed through that Q&A system. It allows uh, for a couple of things. First, it allows us to sort of better record them um, and answer them, uh, get the most appropriate person to, to answer them. You also have a, the ability to chat to the panelists, which I see a few different people um, have um, said hello in, um, but we would ask that you, you, you put all um, your questions into the Q&A as opposed to the chat. The presentation today will be given a brief introduction from myself, Jill Kowalczuk. I'm the uh, director for CANSOC. I'll also have uh, Brian Lesser, the CIO from Ryerson, who will give a good portion of the talk, and Hugo Dominguez from McGill uh, University, who will give the other good portion of the talk. There's a few other panelists that you see on there. Uh, Victoria, she's providing project management support, as well as Idlik Straley, who's uh, providing some support uh, in, the, in his CISO role. And they'll help in terms of moderating some of the questions. Feel free to type in any questions that you might have as we go through the, the seminar. We will save most of the questions to go through and answer for all participants at the end of the seminar. So type them in there and then we'll go through them as we can at the end. Uh, we should have saved a good amount of time for questions at the end, so we should be able to get all, through all three of them. Before I dive into the introduction, the last piece I will say is this is the third webinar we are giving um, to provide an update on the, the CANSOC project. There were two provided previously. If you're interested or you weren't able to attend those and interested in seeing the content that was, that was in those, I encourage you to visit our website and check it out. Uh, they are both archived there. Uh, in particular, we'll talk a little bit about some of the services. Hugo will provide that presentation more from a value-added perspective. But if you're interested in some of the, more of the technical details, we went through that in the second webinar. And if you're interested in a higher level overview of what CANSOC is and who the participants is, are, that is provided was provided in the first webinar. So in terms of our agenda for today, uh, we have three uh, big items uh, that we wanted to, to go through with you. Four, sorry. First, I'll give a quick overview. Um, I'll pass it off to uh, Brian Lesser, who will talk about the continuous monitoring initiative we're looking at in partnership with Cucho and uh, CANSOC. And then um, we'll go into Hugo. We'll talk about the analysis engine value proposition, as well as the threat inter intelligence service value proposition. So really quickly, I don't want to reiterate what we went through in the first two webinars. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this in a lot of detail, but this sort of gives some overview of kind of why is it we're looking at the CANSOC initiative. Um, CANSOC is a proof of concept uh, undertaken by six participant universities. So University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, University of Toronto, Ryerson University, McMaster University and McGill University as well as partnership with the National Research and Education Network to look at um, investigating what might a proof of concept in the Canadian context look like. I'm gonna stand. So for those in Canary, you're on video and we can hear you. Make sure you stay muted. <laughs> um, so in terms of the focus of it in the proof of concept, we're really looking to see how can we um, do more together as opposed to each each institution going off on their own and looking for their value add uh, around the basis of can we do provide services better than what we can do together. The focus is very much on the higher education sector, so colleges and universities, and has a number of other initiatives that were pieces that we're looking at as part of the proof of concept. Before I pass it off to Brian, I just wanted to talk a little bit about sort of where we're at since the last webinar uh, and tie the two together. So we really have sort of three, three, two big focuses. One is on the development, so taking some technologies and testing it out and seeing what services 
uh, that we might be able to provide and how and what that looks like. And those are um, separated into two categories, the analysis engine and the threat intelligence. Again, you saw some of that in the last presentation. So on the analysis engine side, we're receiving data from all of the participant institutions, and we're looking at um, implementing the use cases and, and receiving uh, data from that. On threat intelligence, we're further refining that architecture and seeing how we can stabilize the service uh, to offer it out to the broader community. And we've worked on uh, undertaking what it is we need to deliver in the project charter deliverables. And that's really focused more on what our service catalog looks like, how much it will cost, and how we think we could deliver this. But today's focus, we want to focus on more of these value-added uh, proposition piece, as well as uh, how you might be able to take advantage of uh, the continuous monitoring initiative. So with that, I will pass it. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll give a quick overview in terms of the service catalogs so that you can see what that looks like uh, based on what we talked about um, at the last webinar. So there are two big categories of services that we're talking that we have sort of grouped things together. One is the analysis engine uh, where we're looking at um, collecting data from institutions and providing alerts back to institutions. And the second is on the threat intelligence which has a number of different services uh, as part of that. On the threat intelligence side, we see uh, being able to provide this out to institutions uh, sooner than on the analysis engine because we don't have the added complexity of having to determine how we can get data from each one of those institutions. I won't go into these in more detail, leave it a little bit to Hugo later in the presentation to talk more about um, the value proposition of each of these. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Brian. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what uh, will probably be the first service that uh, you can actually consume from CANSOC, and uh, that'll be the continuous monitoring, which is a sort of partnership between the uh, Cuccio uh, Cybersecurity Benchmarking Project, uh, enabled by BitSight, and uh, working with CANSOC. And I'm trying to click to the next slide, Joe. You're going to help me yeah, here, right? Uh, sorry, for some reason, you don't seem to be one of the people I can... Um give control to so I might have to do it the old-fashioned way where you say next slide my okay. apologies and I'm can you hear me better now I am seeing Isaac is saying it's a bit quiet so I'm gonna hope that's a little better uh, so yes please go ahead to the next slide thanks so just to provide a little uh, background on uh, the Cucho cybersecurity benchmarking project I mean basically this is an idea that if we share information based on real data surveys and so forth uh, we can see what's actually working to secure universities and colleges uh, and then spread that information around and hopefully uh, by doing it as a kind of yearly feedback loop, uh, actually implement and update best practices so that we're all uh, more secure. So that's the, the basic uh, goal of the benchmarking project. And next slide. So this started off actually in 2018 with uh, 40 universities. And then this year we're just wrapping up with 58 colleges and universities. Uh, and we do three things. Uh, we get BitSight cybersecurity ratings for the 58 colleges and universities. We get detailed scores on um, things like how many botnet infections you have. And uh, we also get the forensics data, which gives us things like IP addresses and ports and so forth uh, for each event. Then based partly on that and partly on things we're interested in. We do multiple surveys. Uh, so we might try to correlate, uh, um, you know, how out of date uh, we are on our servers with uh, information that we're gathering about how we're doing vulnerability management uh, and so forth. So we do this kind of analysis. And then we also do surveys on things like how many people have uh, multi-factor authentication, how many employees have it and so forth. Uh, and then, once we've gathered all that, we're also, or as we're gathering that information, having discussions about best practices. So next slide. So BitSight uh, is the first piece of this, and uh, they have a process themselves where they uh, basically collect about 200 billion events every day. Uh, they curate and map that data to 150,000 enterprises. Uh, and then uh, provide scores or grades on various the 23 risk vectors and then give you an overall cybersecurity rating. So I'll let you start clicking through the, the text there. 
so how do they do that? Well, for infected machines, they use honeypots and sinkholes. Uh, so they can actually detect when infected machines are reaching out to command and control servers and so forth. Um, they also detect vulnerabilities. I'll let you just keep clicking, Joe. Uh, and other weaknesses, uh, and they do that by working with all kinds of other folks like service providers uh, who get information uh, when uh, and ad networks, when systems on our campus are reaching out and connecting to those things. So they see, for example, uh, what version of the operating system and browser you have, it can feed that back to you. Uh, so in total, there's about 120 data feeds, uh, you know, some of which are, are more readily available to others than, than and some aren't. Uh, and again, it, they're talking about 200 billion events per day. So it's actually quite remarkable uh, what they can tell us about our own network, considering they're not inside there uh, getting information directly from us. Go ahead to the next slide. So just so you know, here's the 23 risk vectors, uh, and there's a fair number of them. Some we find more um, important than others. Uh, so I think it's on the next slide, go ahead. Yeah, there we go. So you know, here are some that you might focus on more than others. So some basic uh, email system health, uh, botnet infections, of course, uh, we'd rather our machines not be under somebody's remote control. Uh, and then, you know, things like server software, desktop software, if it's out of date and therefore vulnerable. Okay, go to the next slide. So just to wind up on the benchmarking project itself, uh, so here's uh, an example of botnet scores for 58 institutions. And you can see that some of them score 100, which is great, so there's no uh, botnets detected on their, their campuses. Uh, and as the institutions get larger and larger moving to the right, you can see the scores start to drop as there's more and more people on, uh, say, students with infected machines on wireless networks. And one of the things we discovered here was in the first year is that people that had higher scores uh, weren't just smaller, they were also doing certain things like using next generation firewalls to block CNC traffic. And then people who were using both a DNS firewall and the next gen firewall were more effective at blocking traffic and uh, therefore knew about more machines to remediate and so forth. So it's that kind of best practice that uh, some of us that went out and got DNS firewalls and sure enough saw we were detecting more and blocking more traffic. Go ahead, Joel. So during the process uh, of doing the benchmarking, we purchased 30 day vendor monitoring licenses from BitSight. So Kuchio was actually monitoring the different universities and colleges. And during that 30 days, one of the things that BitSight does is send you alerts. So here's an alert that would arrive in my inbox uh, about a uh, potentially exploited machine at Ryerson. Uh, go to the next one. And as well, we would get other information about, uh, information, excuse me, about file sharing, uh, other potentially exploited devices for the different universities we were we were monitoring, and I was just interested in benchmarking and getting our work done there, uh, so we completely ignored these alerts. So go ahead to the next one. What we could have done is gone into the BitSight portal and got the forensics information for each one of these alerts. So here's an example of a botnet infection. Uh, this is from Picker, and uh, I've sort of semi-anonymized the IP address, but this is the kind of information you get. Go ahead to the next one. Um, and this is out of date uh, server software running on a server at Ryerson, so an old version of PHP, which is vulnerable, so that's bad. Uh, and again, this could have been forwarded on uh, to help me remediate these things or to help the various universities remediate these problems. So go ahead to the next one. So what we're proposing, uh, and actually what we're making available in the next round of the benchmarking project is that for those people who are interested in getting continuous monitoring, where uh, these bit side events are generated. They go to a CANSOC analyst. Uh, the analyst could go and pull the uh, forensics information and redistribute them to you, as well as providing you with uh, the more substantial reports you can get from bit site, as well as giving you occasional or episodic vendor access to the bit site portal yourself. Uh, so that's, uh, we would go and license the 365 day uh, license and set this up. So that's the second option in the benchmarking project uh, is to turn this, is to actually use the alerting uh, and feed that information back to people. So go ahead to the next one. So here's the two options and the cost. So uh, the third year of benchmarking, which will be 2020, 
uh, if you just want to do the benchmarking project as we've been doing it, it's going to be roughly $1,200 a year. Uh, and if you want to do the benchmarking project plus the continuous monitoring with CANSOC, we think that's going to be roughly about $3,800 a year. Uh, the price will actually be partly determined by how many people sign up. And for the most part, the more people that sign up, the, the lower costs. Uh, so we don't think it can really rise much above these numbers. But the only way you can get this continuous monitoring option is by participating in the benchmarking project. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide so. Here we go. So one of the questions I keep being asked are, you know, how does this compare to some of the other things we're doing? If you wanted to do self-monitoring where you sign up for BitSight and, uh, and you have constant access to their portal and get your own alerts and so forth, uh, that's tremendously expensive. So, you know, it's going to be well over 30,000 Canadian to do both that self-monitoring and participate in benchmarking. Um, Security Scorecard is currently offering people a much less expensive self-monitoring option. Uh, if you were to purchase that, uh, and that's something that uh, was arranged through Canary, which is great, um, you would see that the benchmarking plus scorecard would cost you roughly 6,200. Uh, and finally, doing the, uh, it's not self-monitoring, but monitoring through CANSOC uh, and doing benchmarking would cost about 3,800. Uh, and so that's just to give you some sense of what the options are and, and what you end up, what they end up costing you. So let's go to the next slide. So, and this is my last slide, and I'll be quiet after that. Uh, so I posted the documentation which describes kind of the terms of service and what the process is. Uh, and so that's the first bit.ly address there. So just bit.ly slash cprocess. Uh, we'll get you that document. So before you go and sign up, you should definitely read that document. Uh, and I'm asking people to sign up for by December 17th. Uh, and the actual project kickoff would be in February. And that would allow us to collect the funds before then and onboard people to the BitSight uh, um, portal, as well as there's some other work that I'm not really talking about in these slides, but we break down your networks into three areas. and. Uh, make sure that we can get forensics and so forth. So there's some onboarding to do there. So that's why it would start kind of mid-February. Uh, once you've read the documentation, then there's the forum where you can just sign up. I had a question recently, do I have to be a member of Kutcher to participate? No, you don't. You just have to sign on to the benchmarking project and you have to be a post-secondary institution of some type. Uh, and then uh, we're also talking with BCNet and Cybera. So you would want to check in with those folks in terms of you know, are they doing a joint purchase of this or is it going to be subsidized or whatever? Or, and also are there opportunities to learn more about this through BCNet and through Cybera? So uh, definitely check in with your regional network if they're involved in this. Uh, and then I'm happy to answer questions. I know that was just me breezing by this all fairly quickly. Uh, so just there's my email, blesser at ryerson.ca. Feel free to write to me directly. And uh, I think that's it for me for now. Great, thanks, Brian. So what we'll do is we'll pass it over to um, Hugo to go through his presentation, and then we will answer all of the questions, kind of go through all the questions on the ends. So if you have any questions that came up, um, you want to type into the Q and A box. We will get to them as we get to the the end. So I do have Hugo in my list, so I will pass control of the screen onto you, Hugo. Thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome. My, uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, as uh, Jill had said earlier, the value proposition for analysis engine and threat intelligence. Uh, basically, is going. I won't go into details. Uh, you can see them in previous uh, in previous um, slides uh, in previous presentation. But what I will present just this, okay. Um, Basically, it's a, an overview of what it is and, um, and uh, what's the value that uh, you may see in it. So the analysis engine is basically the team that's going to have collect the uh, raw events from your organization and eventually um, anal analyze them. Um, as well, so that's both the engine itself uh, and the team that's going to look at it. So what it is, it's a, basically it's a system that's going to consume your event, run them against indicator of compromise, and alert you in a timely basis. 
It's also a center of expertise where you're going to have advanced security specialists uh, that are going to do different type of work. One of them is uh, investigating a bit more um, the events themselves, identifying if they need to be prioritized and provide you with some guidance and saying, this is what you should be doing. Again, the member is still responsible to act upon these alerts. So it's not the, a direct resolution. Um, it's a team that actually just vets the major events, has a broader vision of what it is of uh, of the events that are being that are occurring. They're also developing use cases. These use cases are run are used to identify these alerts. Uh, we envision that these use cases will be able to be shared across different organization. Again, some of them may have to be adapted if you have a local sim but at least understanding what kind of, of analysis we're doing in some cases are gonna be shared. And the overall long-term goal would be to have 24 seven monitoring for key use cases with escalation to local site. Again, that's gonna be evaluated that that was a target that we had initially. Um, one of the things that it provides you as well is a contextualized analysis uh, based on external vulnerability scans. So one of the things that we're envisioning, and you're going to see it at the Trail Intel, is doing combining your the external scanner of vulnerability with the it, possible incidents that we're seeing. So we can say there's been a tr an attack an attack attempted against a target. And by the way, that target is exposed on the internet. And by the way, from what we see, it seems to be vulnerable, creating that sense of urgency within your internal teams. What it will not be. So uh, I know that last time when we presented the, the technical solution, a lot of people were, were asking, will that replace my SIM? That will not you replace your local SIM uh, to conduct forensic or diagnostic on site. So that is aiming at having that global view, that national view of doing the analysis. And one of the things that you need to bear in mind is that um, the data that is going to be collected is in the context of the mission of the CANSOC, which is identifying indicator of compromise or possible security events. A lot of people are also using their local SIM as a, I would say, an operational a uh, tool to a diagnostic tool to see where in your infrastructure a traffic flow may be blocked. It's not, the goal is not to replace these capabilities. And we're building that SIM in order to be able to scale and be affordable in the service based on open source solution. So as you may understand, we're not yet to the maturity of a commercial SIM that could could provide that a commercial sim may provide you in terms of flexibility although some people have are in that valley of of uh, of uh, despair because uh, you don't see the value added you're getting from your sim and that's where the the, the use cases are going to come in but basically what we're positioning the service to be is not a replacement for your sim if you don't have any it's better than nothing because you're going to get some monitoring and some alerting. But the overall goal is uh, on a midterm basis for sure. Not we will not be able to provide the same the the, the level of of maturity that a commercial sim may offer. So that's what it's not. And basically, in the mid ben the core benefit that you would have in there is that by forwarding your events, you're going to have an enriched uh, monitoring of, of your events in the context of everyone that is also providing information there. In terms of trail intelligence, uh, as you've seen probably in the past, that's divided in three core capabilities. One of them is the threat hunting, uh, one of them is the vulnerability management, and the third one is red team intrusion testing. So the initial deliveries, I'm, I'm going to talk about what we envision as being short to midterm deliveries, um, as that's going to grow uh, over time. So, in the threat hunting space, we have two core services that uh, I, I would say one of them is the threat feeds, and the second one is the executive news briefs. 
So in the thread feed, that's enabled by two core services. One of them is MISP and one of them is MindMail to transform the IOCs collected in MISP and then uh, create some uh, created in a format that can be ingested by your protection device. So the typical example was uh, we're going to build a list of bad IPs that you should be blocking because we have a high level of confidence that they shouldn't be in your network. Produce that through MindMail as an XML, and then you can get that to an API and feed that inside your firewall so that you are blocked as we're enriching the indicator of compromise database. So what does the MIS provide you? Um, and I don't want to go too much into the like into the what the technical solution is because that's been already presented. But basically, it's a central repository, uh, the CanSoc version, where you can have access as a self-service portal, is a central repository of all of the IOCs. The core benefit out of the of a MIS that is being managed centrally by CANSOC is that all of the indicators of compromise that we're ingesti ingesting from different sources are going to be vetted by a full-time experts that are going to provide a level of confidence over these IOCs. For example, we're getting a blacklist from various sources and I'll give you the example. Uh, we had an issue with, with, with our uh, firewall vendor flag the IP as being malicious just had it just happened to be uh, the office 360 one of the office 365 uh, IP therefore creating a nice uh, denial of service on, on on all of our office 365 footprint so the goal in there is to have that pre-vetting of these IPs and these indicators of compromise so that you can have rely you can rely on the quality of information that is going to go through there so we're talking about IP, malicious files, um, sender's email, basically everything that you would have in terms of sharing that. Um, that's gonna give you as well a, nation, a national view on IOCs as people are gonna contribute inside that database, but we're not only relying on, on people to contribute. Uh, CanSoc analysis team is gonna also put their um, IOCs inside that database. Plus, we're creating a um, partnership with different, uh, with different partners. So far, we have signed with uh, the uh, Communication Security Establishment, um, the uh, Secrets, Canadian Secret Service, and uh, we're looking into commercial feeds, and we'll soon consume all of RAN ISAC uh, information. Now, some of these uh, external feed vendors or, or partners have MISP integration, which makes it easier if you want to integrate their database with ours. But in some cases, they, it requires some pre-processing in order to have an integration. So rather than each of you or each of the members recreating that integration, we can create it only once at one point, and then everyone would want to have their local MISP if they choose to be so then they can connect to the CANSOC MISP and get that information without maintaining all of the different partnership or the different integration with the different partners. Which doesn't prevent you from using your own at, at the same time and saying that I want to build my own, uh, which is the third line there, uh, which for this we're providing uh, value by having pre-built Docker container configuration that is faster for you to implement. And I, as I was uh, explaining it just before, the mind meld is rather than them creating all of these MISP, uh, creating uh, all of your custom extraction from MISP to create feeds for IP blacklists, uh, when, uh, malicious files, and things like that. We're envisioning, or we're, we're going to provide, that's already been demonstrated as a proof of concept, that we're going to produce these lists, and then you can just consume them. So you can, you can just be a consumer accessing the central MISP uh, instance and then um, and, and browsing through it. You can decide to consume the blacklist that would be um, the blacklist or the, 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 the list on which you want to act. Um, and that the main benefit for that is that from the point that we are declaring an IP as being malicious, you already have 
um, you already have the, the possibility to receive the output of that and integrate it into your protection or detection mechanism that can feed into a SIM, that can feed into your firewall, that could feed, feed into your, your, um, your um, endpoint protection device. So those are all of the kind of services that you have and, that would, and, and benefits that you would get from there. That's basically not replicate, replicating all of the analysis that comes into looking in those uh, into looking at these uh, at these external feeds. The last uh, the so that's that recap the, the threat feed type of service on the executive brief uh, service. Mainly, what it is is that uh, for all of the major security events. So, depending on uh, in the sector of education, the goal is to. And sometimes in the sector of education or something that may be related to what your executive may ask you. So there was a big uh, Capital One breach. There was a big Desjardins breach. Uh, there's been the news about Desjardins, about, uh, about the CIO's uh, career being over uh, yesterday. So those are kind of news that people are asking, say, well, why? Or, or, or are we protected from these type of events? And we're getting more and more of the board executives uh, the executives of the university asking these questions. So rather than each of us taking a, a each of us taking the, um, the the news, trying to analyze it, uh, make it uh, make it accessible in terms of uh, on an executive level. The overall time is to the overall goal is that we're going to have people that are just going to do that and send that back to all of the members, saying, okay. Um, this is what happened. This is the core. This is uh, what uh, what we can see as what happened, or what we can induce that happen. And then this is what we would recommend for you to check upon. You have control for this, 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 and this. This is what we hear in the market that people are doing in response to that. And that would basically be and and that that can be something that you can just adapt. Um, very quickly, rather than spending all of the time of creating that. Um, the overall, uh, and the overall goal at, at the same time, uh, beyond informing your, your executives, is also to take that information and turn into the IT team and say, hey, are we protected against this? This is what other people are doing. Are we having the same issue? So the overall goal there is save time because this is something that people are spending a lot of time or some time on, and people are gonna spend more and more time on it as the executives are gonna start being more and more aware of these issues and ask for, for information. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that recaps the threat uh, hunting uh, core services that we're envisioning on a short to medium term basis. Vulnerability scan, in a nutshell, the solution that uh, we've started experimenting on is using a basic Nessus Pro scanner and developing our own BI stack for reporting on top of it. So one of the uh, one of the core value proposition is finding a low cost alternative to a commercial offering. Again, that is not as mature as you may have in the commercial offering, but it's better than nothing if you have nothing. Um, it's also um, allowing the CanSoc team to have visibility over what is exposed to the internet in terms of billability. And when I was talking about the analysis engine they're gonna be able to send you more customized sense of urgency um, events based on your exposure on the internet. Um, one of the role, one of the benefit in there as well is a lot of us have um, either um, have a compliance a requirement to be externally scanned. So it, unless you have like some very hard PCI scan that would, could act as a service. Um, one of the things that we're offering through the service as well is the enriched sources for customized risk rating. So basically, we're also looking at what do hackers are using to try to find billable system on the internet and injecting that and saying, 
you have this vulnerability and on top of it, it's publicly key available and documented so people are using it. So you may have a different sense of urgency on acting upon it. It allows you as well to benchmark yourself against the average of all of the other members. So as people are gonna embark, one of the reports that we're looking at is that you can't select a specific member but you can say, compare, my, compare me to the average or compare me to the best, for example. And the overall goal in this is allowing to create a service where as people are gonna have ideas about what kind of reports that they want, have the accessibility to the developing team so that they can easily customize reports and create new reports that may be of interest for all. So I would say that's mainly the benefit for, for us, like if I, and I'll, I'll talk about it because I think that different organizations are gonna find different value or different level of value in this. But the overall goal in there is that it's trying to reduce time at managing the solution by having someone else manage the solution, just be the consumer of the solution, having more sources around it and being able to benchmark yourself against others. Internal scanning, we're, we're considering it to be uh, eventually to, uh, to something that we'll, we'll want to develop, but not right away. On a medium term basis, uh, one of the service we're, uh, we're looking into is a um, um, being able to spin up a GoFish instance, individual instance for organization to be able to conduct um, phishing campaign uh, and awareness tool. So basically a lot of organizations are using commercial offering. Very often they're gonna target their community based on the licensing scheme that, uh, that uh, these external providers that or these commercial offering have. Uh, our goal was to find a solution that could scale up to whichever amount of users that you have, knowing that more and more we have also to create phishing campaign awareness for students and alumni and every users within within your your perimeter um, so the overall goal or the value proposition is to identify a low cost alternative but beyond the phishing campaign tool instance that most people can spin within their own organization um, the goal is to have also a central um, I would say a central team that are gonna develop what's missing compared to some of the commercial offering. Among the different gap that we've identified so far is like true LDAP integration for uh, importing your user, Outlook button for reporting uh, email, better reporting through BI, um, and as well having the flexibility to use campaigns developed by others to try to, to save time in creating those those different uh those different campaigns again overall goal was is reduce costs try to maximize coverage which right now and as everyone is going to have the same challenge trying to have um trying to have uh, some of these um trying to have a, a, a better solution Uh, so last thing on the threat intel uh, on the threat intel that I would want to discuss is um, basically you see all of these services at a high level um, but the main thing there is that different organizations are going to see uh, different value in the same in, in the same areas that I've discussed for example, having a shared anal having an analysis engine, if you have a mature SIM within your organization, you may not see a lot of value added around it for now uh, until the service matures. Or if you already have a phishing campaign tool, you may say, well, for me, it's not that worth it because I'm still covering most of the critical users that I need. For other organizations who don't have anything or are at looking at a fast track to start with something and start experimenting because their level of maturity in their cybersecurity journey is not as high, those would have greater value. So the perception of the value will truly vary based on where you are as an organization, um, the current solution that you have, 
the maturity that you have in using the solution and in some cases the size of your internal teams if, if you don't have if you can save have the FTD to manage all of your infrastructure uh, providing this it may be worthwhile looking at an alternative that is mainly managed and then you just you can spend that time doing something so the core areas are are mainly the information that you're going to have available that's one of the core value that you're gonna you're, you're gonna get again you can sign your own agreement with CSC with C, uh, with Ken cyber with different organization but then you're gonna have to recreate the integration that everyone that has already been done rather than creating just one cover it the coverage of the solution like your user community that you want to cover the the hours that people are going to take a uh, spend in looking at these things the time you spend in managing your solution in some cases the cost of the solution in some and in the maturity of the solution and the overall coverage the overlapping coverage you may have with existing solution so those are pros and cons and there's not a an easy or a, a cookie cutter say this is the value is that this is the offering these are the core things that are being in the offering and then you need to compare it to what can, what do i do right now what can i afford moving forward and is this a value in terms of to me on in the short or medium term so in terms of the 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 recap of this i would say value will vary in by individual service by different institution based on your level of maturity, but one way or the other, the fact that it's shared is an opportunity for you to have access to better information and a broader, a broader information for, for uh, ingesting within internally within your organization. And I would think that recaps my part. Great, thanks Hugo. Uh, so with that, what we'll do is we'll quickly try and get through as many of the questions um, as we possibly can. So what we'll do is, again, just a reminder, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A and we'll do our best to get through uh, as many of them as possible in the remaining 15 minutes. So first question, it's for Brian. Will this also allow for the evaluation of common third-party vendors? Okay, so if it's okay, I've read all the BitSight and benchmarking related questions and I'll just try to rip through them. So stop me, Jill, if, because there's, if you need to for time. But uh, so yes, uh, there's a conversation with BitSight about the license, but apparently we can go and uh, uh, monitor other people. So we could monitor Canary, uh, we could monitor uh, D2L and structure and so forth. Uh, and make those reports available to everybody involved in the benchmarking project. And because we're buying uh, BitSight licenses in bulk, uh, the cost to do that would be much lower um, and so forth. So I envision we'll be able to post reports uh, that we pick up you know, every so many months or however we want to do this. It's all to be defined and make the third party vendor information available. Uh, that's something I still have to work on. There was another question about uh, what option you get with the with the 14 day license. You're really talking there about option one, and so what kind of service do you get was the question. Uh, and if you choose option one, you do the full benchmarking project. But in terms of what you get from BitSight, you get one year of data uh, from them, all their reports, forensics, and so forth. Uh, and you get only 14 days of access to the BitSight portal to go through that information in online if you want, but you can download all of that information uh, uh, and have it to refer to, but you don't get the ongoing year-long monitoring, and, and that's about it. Um, somebody asked, what do you mean by occasional or episodic access? And the way BitSight works is that uh, a CanSoft analyst can give you temporary vendor access, which means that you can log into the portal yourself for 14 days. Uh, and so we will not be giving you every 14 days access to BitSight. It's just when you need it for some reason. So an analyst can send you a full year long report whenever, but if you really want to get in there and spelunk around in BitSight, imagine doing that maybe three or four times a year at the most um to go in and see the the thing yourself but you get all that all that information in a different way without logging into bitsite so that's the occasional access piece um 
there was a question about what kind of specific events, like could we say we only want certain alerts uh, to come through? Right now, we're just imagining an analyst getting all the alerts, collecting the forensic data and sending it to you. Uh, and probably that's what we're gonna start with. And then if we need to maybe stop reporting on some things we know are false positives, we'll work through that, but it's early days for that. Uh, how are we gonna communicate results? It'll be via email right now. So when you sign up, we're asking you for email address to send alerts to. Uh, when will CanSoc analysts be available? Again, I think that's as the project starts. So depending on when you onboard to it, but that'll probably be mid-February. Uh, is this a, a yearly or multi-year agreement you're citing? Uh, it's basically right now it's yearly, um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. And I think that's it for me. Okay, great, thanks, um, uh, Brian. Uh, so we'll go through some of the other uh, questions. The next question is, how will CanSoc communicate back and forth with consumers of these two services in real time? time. I'm not sh sure what you mean with two services, but maybe I can just talk a little bit about the communication. So I think Brian's touched on how we plan on communicating with participants as it relates to the continuous monitoring initiative. In terms of the sort of communication for each one of the other services, it very much depends upon what the service is and how it develops. So I will reiterate that this is still a proof of concept. We have moved along to start to envision what things we might be able to offer in near term and what things might be longer term. So for example, when you, you know, go back and think about Hugo's presentation, the sort of stuff around red team, that's all long term. That's you know, ideas that we've sort of think about, thought about. We haven't really materialized them in any way or really properly tested them out versus on the other hand, the threat feed um, service, we really stood up architecture, tested it, and are looking to move it into more of that pilot and stabilizing service period. So as we do that, exactly how we will communicate with the different participants will start to evolve um, in, that, in that context. So I can't completely answer it specifically. Um, we are envisioning, so some of it will be via email, uh, for sure, at the, at the start. Some of it, you know, if you think about the threat feed, potentially will give access for participating institutions to log in and look at feeds inside the web portal. That is a possibility, but it's still evolving. So I'll actually jump in with that to one of the next questions around, you know, can the analysis engine and associated staff liaise with an MSSP who currently handles the SIM? Because they might be tasked with having the final word in escalating issues to our organization, potentially. So what I would say there is that's a great um, suggestion. It's something that we would take offline, really look at what that might look like, um, given uh, different institutions and their different institutional capabilities. So answer is maybe. We'll think about it and get back to you. Great question, though. Uh, so the next question was, how is this related to uh, the Canary Joint Security Project uh, that was presented in November and a number of institutions have signed up on? So in terms of, of the Joint Security Project, uh, on the analysis engine side, we're looking at ways in which uh, we can pull data into the analysis engine and provide do analysis on use cases and provide it back. And so the technology that has been um, deployed in the Joint Security Project, the Grove Zeek technology is one of the pieces that we are looking at. In terms of directly how the two projects would um, sort of work together, we've started discussions about what that might look like with Canary, but uh, it's still under development. So more on that perhaps in our next yet to be scheduled webinar. Um, so the next question is, will the executive news brief be available in uh, French. So great question. We just discussed that, uh, started the discussion on that today. Uh, so we are looking at being able to provide that service in French and English initially. Um, final word or details still to be determined, but that service particularly is one that we see value in providing in, in um, both official languages. Um, so next Question. So many questions. Um, so there was a question around procurement and selling. I will say that 
Can stock right now is a proof of concept, so it's not selling anything. What we're doing is taking some technologies, standing them up, investigating them with a small number of, of participants to see whether or not this provides value to those partic participants, as well as potentially the broader community. A smaller group was um, got together to start the proof of concept just to allow sort of a quicker iteration and understanding of questions. And so this isn't intended to be a service that you would go out and issue an RFP for and CanSoc would bid on it. Um, I suppose in theory that that could be, but that's not really the way we're envisioning it. We're envisioning it more like, um, you know, let, to use uh, the, the, the benchmarking initiative, it's not something that you sell and do a procurement for, but it's rather one of these partnerships that you would engage in as um, a post-secondary institution. So next question, Hugo, maybe you can answer this one is, will CanSoc analyze network traffic uh, from uh, network provider perspectives, such as Orion or Risk? Um, basically, uh, that's currently not planned to be analyzed at that stage. So what they're looking into more is trying to create integration with uh, high, likely the, um, the SIM, uh, the RAN SIM. So basically, they're going to have their own, uh, their own SIM. So they may have, based on what they have, if they can provide some of the IP traffic, but we're not planning on, let's say, taking either Orion or Canary right now and saying, hey, develop this and forward us all of the events of all of their traffic flows across all of the network in Canary or, or in the local rents. So the, the current uh, architecture that we're looking at is more of the connection nodes uh, within each institution to forward the events that are being required for the for the shared sim. Great, thanks. So a couple other questions we had was, is the project only open to post-secondary institutions or will other educational organizations have access in the future? Um, this is currently under discussion. Uh, the current sort of thinking is to focus on the post-secondary uh, sector. Although there have been discussions about the value it could add to a broader perspective, there, um, you know, we're still sort of figuring out what is it we will provide, how will those things be provided, and who they will be provided to. So I would say in the immediate term, it's likely going to be post-secondary, but as we look um, to the future, it could potentially uh, broaden. Next question I'll just answer really quick. Is the MIST, doc MIST Docker container freely available? It is an open source solution developed out of um, Europe, uh, partly funded from the European Union, because it's, I believe it is available for anyone and everyone to download. So there was a question, if you have not yet participated in the joint security project, um, but have signed up for 2020, sure what that means is this initial onboarding to this project so there is no direct connection between the joint canary joint security project and CANSOC we are looking at discussing how we might be able to work together but there is no um, direct initiative so I would say no even if you know you know keep doing what you're doing today um, and we'll continue to provide additional information about exactly how you would um, subscribe to some of these other services if and when they may be provided in the future um, so there was a specific question related to pay on the continuous monitoring. I would uh, encourage you, Brian, do you want to answer it? I'm sure it's on that C process page you noted. I'm not sure which question you're asking, but um, someone asked about who are they signing up with uh, for this and who do they pay the money to? I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring to, but it's all to Cuccio. So uh, that's the Canadian University Council of Chief Information Officers who are running the benchmarking project. So you sign up with them, uh, and uh, but you know uh, when you sign up on the sign up sheet, there's a whole bunch of information uh, that then comes to you about the onboarding process uh, and all the things you have to do. But that document that I shared about the process uh, explains a good deal of that. And then when you actually go through the sign up form, uh, it walks you through some of the things that you need to do. 
Um, so, you know, it's a kind of evolving story. So you sign up in December, you get more information from me, uh, you get an invoice which you need to pay and so forth. And then uh, there's an onboarding process so that by about mid-February, uh, you've got access to the data and you're starting to go iteratively through some of the information we're benchmarking. Great, thanks, Brian. Since you're on, another question was, what will initial benchmarking steps uh, from the CanSoc analysts and what are the steps involving the initial access to data? I assume this is related to continuous monitoring. Yeah, so, so there's actually, look in the document uh, and if you have specific questions, just email me at C-L-E-S-S-E-R at Ryerson.ca. Um, it's, it's a bit of a long story, all this stuff, but CanSoc analysts will not be involved in benchmarking. So all the CanSoc analyst is doing is getting the alerts, pulling the forensic data, and sending them back to you. When you start on with the benchmarking project, you start looking at all this data, and so it becomes more familiar to you and you understand what you're seeing. Uh, and uh, as well, the, just very briefly, the first part of the onboarding process is you actually look at the data in BitSight, make sure the IP addresses and, and other things for your institution are correct, Make sure they've broken down your wireless and residence networks separately from your core networks and so forth. And then we start getting in going risk vector by risk vector. How are you doing? How do you compare to other people? You start getting the uh, benchmarking data from us uh, and we just go through those most of those 23 vectors and do surveys and so forth. So it's, a, it's not something that you do in one week. It's actually uh, weeks and weeks of work, uh, but it's spread out so it's not too painful. Uh, in terms of the commitment of any one person. So that's also part of the goal is not to drive you crazy uh, with this. And you end up with a report uh, almost a full year later. Thanks, Brian. So uh, in the interest of time, I guess I'll just end on a, a couple of final points. There are a few final questions that we weren't able to get to. I will note, um, reiterate one more time, it is a proof of concept. So some of the questions that um, we haven't answered is because we don't yet have the answer. So the value of really undertaking this initiative in the concept of a proof of concept is it really lets us try different things out and, and get answers as we go along. And so I hope it's been made clear over our three webinars that, you know, we don't have all of the answers. Um, and so, but as we learn more, our goal is to connect with the broader community on these webinars and provide the information that we do have. There was a question about sort of short-term services. I will say the nearest term and only service that CanSoc will provide is the continuous monitoring service that Brian uh, talked about. And really we were able to do that because we were doing it in partnership with an existing initiative that was already out there. So a lot of that framework was in place. In terms of other services, I think you can sort of tell through the two, the last two webinars we've done, the maturity level of where we're at along our investigation on the different services. Um, but we're really not ready to sort of take any money and sign anyone up for any of the other services that you've seen yet. Um, but we are getting there. So we will kind of continue to keep the community in the loop as we go forward. Uh, and I guess with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining. We will archive the presentation for those who had to leave early or joined late. We will get it up on the website and we will send out a note when that is posted as well as a little survey to get some feedback from you on the current, uh, on, on this webinar as well as what you might like to see in the future. So we can continue to disseminate information out to the broader community with this. Uh, we had just targeted this three, these three webinars, but we'll take a step back and, and look at revisiting with um, additional webinars in the future. So thanks, Hugo and Brian, um, and support from Canary on providing the, the webinar. And if you have any other questions, you can look us up on the website or send us an email. Have a great day.